the Shelter Forum is a community of practice for to share knowledge regarding humanitarian shelter and settlement. The UK Shelter Forum is not an organisation and it's not affiliated with any organisation. It's just a community of practice. Behind the scenes is about 10 people just doing this in our free time. Um, and it passes from organisation to organisation each time. So this UK Shelter Forum is co-hosted by UCL and the Norwegian Refugee Council. If you want to find out more about the UK Shelter Forum, you can go to shelterforum.info. This is the 28th. The first one was held in December 2011, uh, no, December 2006. Um, you might be thinking, why is it the UK Shelter Forum if we're thinking about humanitarian shelter and settlements? That's a good question. We started having these forums in the UK. And if you go to shelterforum.info, you'll see that there's now one in Asia, one in MENA, one in Latin America and the Caribbean. And that is really cool and exciting that there might be forums like this happening all over the world. Uh, during COVID, a lot of those have gone online. The UK Shelter Forum went online and so did those other forums. So it's possible to join the Africa Shelter Forum online, which is also really cool and exciting. But some people online joining us right now might be thinking, but there isn't one in my country, in which case start one, you know, and we will help you do that. So email us, contact people, think about starting your own shelter forum and forming your own community of practice. Uh, so this one, the 28th one, uh, Amelia and I decided to focus on shelter and climate change, posing the question, is the shelter sector ready? Uh, we have funding from uh, USAID via the shelter cluster and the Danish Refugee Council. <laughs> um, um, yeah. And our own sweat and tears. <laughs> Mainly our own <laughs> sweat and tears. Yeah, next slide, please. Ah, okay, so finally, a bit more about the theme. I am, I set the question really, uh, because the background to this is, of course, there is climate change, of course, there is a climate crisis. But in May last year, I think the Red Cross and Red Crescent launched the Climate Charter, um, and which has several commitments that humanitarian organizations and other organizations are signing up to. Uh, lots of uh, the organizations in the shelter cluster have signed up to them. Some haven't, this is interesting, but we, um, the question for me now is okay, there is a climate crisis, all right, there is a climate charter, we've agreed to do these things, but the question for me is how to do these things. Um, and I suggest, I wanted to host this conference because I'm most interested in the first two commitments in the Climate Charter. How do we step up our response to growing humanitarian needs and help people adapt to the impacts of the climate and environmental crises while maximizing the environmental sustainability of our work and rapidly reducing our greenhouse gas emissions? I think those are really good topics. I would like to know how the shelter sector is going to do those things. Oh, next slide. So that was background from the UK Shelter Forum here, UCL. We are very happy to have you here back at UCL. This is the third UK Shelter Forum I've hosted. Uh, we've previously been in a different department. I am now in, uh, in the Institute of Risk and Disaster Reduction. They are, lots of my colleagues are here, lots of my students are here, and they are uh, supporting this forum. Um, in our department, uh, we have already a, like a thriving Great. PhD community. We have two master's courses on risk and resilience and disaster reduction. And the new thing, the reason why I joined the department is we have a new BSc in global humanitarian studies. Uh, so this is for undergraduates and it just started this year. And five of my first year students are here today. So talk to them, they're lovely. Also more specifically, they're looking for internships. Um, so if you'd like an intern, um, I think, uh, not quite yet, but I'm sure by coffee, there's going to be flyers about how to get an intern, and you can just talk to <laughs> they're very nice. <laughs> I think I'll stop pitching that now. Um, I think that's it from me. Okay. Amelia. Okay, well, I won't add much more. Um, I just wanted to say that I was uh, very excited when Victoria suggested that we co-host the, the Shelter Forum together. Um, I've recently started working at NRC. Um, some of you might know me in previous uh, iterations of my career, but um, it's been a really exciting first 
seven or eight months, um, where we've been looking at how to reduce our environmental impact and respond to what we know will be a doubling probably in needs um, in the coming years in terms of uh, humanitarian displacement and uh, risk mitigation and um, various other crises. Um, and we were actually, as reflecting yesterday, we haven't had a shelter forum or a specific conference that looks at climate change and and shelter, which is kind of surprising. But also, I like to think it's because all of us have been trying to keep this in mind while we work anyway. Um, but perhaps all working in silos or struggling a little bit, not quite knowing where to reach the information, who knows what, how can we find the expertise that perhaps we need at, in, in a timely manner as well. Um, so I'm hoping that this is the beginning of a little bit more of a, a group effort, a collective front to um, sharing ideas, building knowledge, um, and being more prepared because we aren't ready, but I feel we can be more ready than we are. So, um, yeah. Now, the exciting thing about choosing this topic is we've been able to reach out to people outside the sector and ask them to share some of their knowledge with us. So we've got two excellent uh, keynote speakers. We have Tilly from the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Centre and we have Paul from ADAPT Initiative. So, Tilly. Um, a pleasure to be with you all today and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so my name is Tilly Alcana. I'm a technical advisor on health and climate change at the Red Cross Climate Center. And for those of you that aren't so familiar with the Red Cross Climate Center, we are a technical reference center that sits within the IFRC, so the International Federation of the Red Cross Red Crescent Movement. And we offer sort of advice, um, scientific analysis, and support to the national societies and, all, um, and the ICRC within the Red Cross Movement, but also to any partners that we work with outside of, um, outside of the movement also. And today to sort of ground us um, as one of the first uh, speeches, I wanted to get us all on the same page in terms of the fundamentals of the IPCC report. So these are the Intergovernmental Panel um, on Climate Change reports, which are extremely um, important uh, and are the basis for a lot of our understanding of what is going on. And then because quite often the interactions when it comes to climate change are pretty complex, I wanted to contextualize this within uh, a certain case study. So I wanted to draw on um, the case studies that we conducted at the Climate Center, which were looking at the climate change impacts on health and livelihoods. And I'll try and pull out anything that was to do with shelter um, that we touched on in those reports to help contextualize um, climate projections and impacts. And then I'm gonna round it off um, by talking about how climate change sits within the wider planetary boundaries um, and comment on what this means for planetary and human health. Um, and hopefully that is also useful for you guys. So the key concept that we are talking about is indeed climate change, um, which is attributed directly or indirectly to human activity. Um, and this is the, the key definition in the UNFCCC. Um, and to begin with, we should really think back in terms of historical responsibility of where we are right now with the climate crisis. And historical responsibility for the climate breakdown does indeed lie with the US, the EU, the EU28 pre-Brexit, um, the rest of Europe, um, and the global north in general. Um, the USA alone accounts for 40% of excess greenhouse gas emissions. So they've taken up 40% extra of their fair share um, of our atmospheric commons in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and you can see the tiny little box of the global south in terms of what they have contributed towards greenhouse gas emissions. You can see that there is disproportionate um, greenhouse gas emissions versus the risks that they are facing. This is what it looks like historically, and I think it's very important to think historically, um, but that is not to deny that China, yes, currently does have the highest emissions of any country, but a lot of that is also still to do with producing commodities um, that we use in the rich countries. Um, so I just wanted to have that for us to think about also. So the IPCC is made up of three main um, working groups and three main reports. The first one is on, is, yeah, um, is on the physical science basis. Um, 
And they, uh, this was published in, um, they're published pretty frequently, and the most recent one was published um, in uh, 2021. And there, for the first time, they absolutely uh, said it's indisputable that human activities are causing climate change, driving extreme weather events, um, heat waves, heavy rainfall, droughts. So unequivocal is really um, the word that we link with the physical science basis, working group one of the IPCC reports. The last four decades have been successfully uh, warmer than any preceding decade, average rainfall over land has increased, hot extremes and heat waves are more frequent, um, heavy rainfall has increased, major tropical cyclones of category three and five um, have increased, and um, compound extreme events have increased. So that's, say, a drought happening uh, and a flood happening in the same country or happening one after another um, or happening in very close proximity. Working, oh no, the mouse is working. IPCC Working Group 2 is about impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. This was published earlier this year. Um, and uh, drawing on the scientific evidence, which is unequivocal, climate change is a huge threat to human well-being and to the health of the planet. Any further delay in concerted global action will miss the brief, rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. Um, and Working Group 2 really highlights that impacts are magnified in cities um, because more than 50% of the world's population now live in cities and that multiple extreme um, events compound risk, which is much more difficult for us to manage when there are sequential or overlapping um, uh, extreme weather events, for example. Um, this is more likely to overwhelm a lot of our systems. But there is combinations of climate and non-climactic factors which are increasing risk as well. So rapid urbanization, um, growing inequity, all of this is increasing um, risk around the world. Working group two also, um, is very solutions oriented uh, and uh, does offer as part of the adaptation um, and sort of resilient development uh, subsections within it, solutions, um, learning from nature, increasing the green and blue spaces um, in cities and lots of retrofitting existing buildings, as well as making sure that um, future buildings are net uh, zero or carbon zero, sorry. But this report also stresses that there are limits to adaptation. Um, and that above 1.5 degrees of heating, some solutions, some adaptations, and some natural solutions and nature-based solutions just may not work any longer. Working Group 3, the one that has just most recently been published, is about mitigation of climate change. Um, and effectively, we're not on track to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C, um, and it really is now or never in the next 10 years. Um, Every action and every decision absolutely matters. And in the mitigation side of it, probably something that um, the audience here is very, very familiar with, are the, um, the mitigation elements of zero carbon buildings, those retrofits um, and any new buildings being very, very um, climate proof, very future proofed as well of what may come about. So the summary of these three is, uh, it is unequivocal that it's human activities. The impacts are huge and wide reaching. Adaptation is very important, but there is limits to how much we can adapt um, for every degree of extra warming. And then mitigation now or never, because our window really is closing. So to put all of that into uh, a certain context, um, I chose Pakistan, which was one of the 11 um, climate change impacts on health and livelihoods assessments that we did at the Red Cross Climate Center. Um, and each of these reports, they're all available online if you want to um, check them. They uh, cover eight countries in Asia Pacific and then three in sort of Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, but they start off with the climate projections of the country and then go on to talk about the impacts on livelihoods and the impacts on health, really trying to understand the feedback loop between um, if your livelihood is impacted, then you're less likely to be able to afford um, for healthcare if you don't have universal health coverage in that country. Um, and then likewise, when your health is affected, you're much, there's high chances that your livelihood will become affected um, because you're unable to work on a given day um, or for longer. So in Pakistan, uh, lots of um, lit review showed us that there is an increased frequency and intensity of heat waves, droughts, river iron, flash floods, landslides, sea storms, and cyclones. This is very high confidence. Um, so anyone that is doing any shelter activities in Pakistan, there is a lot that is going to be happening. Um, significant increases in temperature, high confidence on that as well. Um, this is causing faster glacial melt up in the, the high mountains, which is changing the whole Indus River system, which has huge downstream effects then on agriculture, but also on any um, settlements or cities that are, um, are along the Indus River. 
uh, the number of hot days and nights is increasing. There's high confidence of this. This is also very important when we think about the built environment and where people are living in the ambient temperatures that they're in. Um, changes in rainfall trends are slightly less clear. Uh, there are shifting seasons. So peak summer rains might shift to August and winter rains shifting to March. Less certainty around this, but also what does that mean in terms of sort of the planning that we have to do, um, understanding um, what this means for agriculture as well and transport. Uh, extreme wet days are likely to increase across the whole of the country, apart from the Sindh province, where drought might be more likely. So it's also very important when thinking of adaptation strategies in a country to really have it very specific to the certain region that you're working in. Um, and then there is sea level rise and coastal flooding, which is uh, um, high confidence, almost certain, no, certain for sure. Um, so cit cities like Karachi will be hugely affected in any of the rest along um, the coast. Uh, and so we try to pull out the impacts on agriculture, on food security, um, acknowledging this big backdrop of multidimensional poverty, what this might mean for displacement, um, and then also infrastructure damage. And um, Pakistan is also uh, one, it, I mean, 50% of city dwellers in Pakistan live in informal settlements. So if you have got um, much, much hotter days, and then the compounding risks of floods, more likely from changes in the Indus River system. Um, this is a pretty huge number of people that are going to be affected. And historically, floods have destroyed millions of houses. Um, Heat-related deaths uh, are very, very common as temperatures are increasing, hitting above. I mean, there's a huge heat wave at the moment across India, um, which is also reaching into Pakistan. So um, yeah, heat and shelter, hugely linked. Indoor air pollution, also quite a risk. Um, and then other sort of infectious diseases that we need to think about more, especially in urban um, settings, when temperatures increase up to a point, um, that favors dengue fever transmission, um, and what that means also in cities and settlements, and, and what your housing is like. Can you protect yourself against mosquitoes getting into your house or not? Um, and then when it comes to flooding and that sort of infrastructure damage, what does this mean in terms of cutting populations off, not only from markets, but then also from health facilities? Um, this is like an overall schematic of everything that we are trying to look at in terms of health outcomes. Um, so we were looking at mortality, injury, malnutrition, um, uh, respiratory diseases, all the non-communicable non diseases, as well as um, infectious diseases. And the two... Um, main mediating factors that we really looked at were sort of the environment and then the socio-demographic um, factors that will influence who is at risk um, and what is placing them at risk. So what is it about the ecosystem change or the land use change um, or the housing that they're in or the cities that they find themselves in, the context that they're in, their level of poverty, policies that dictate um, who is and is not at risk. Um, that is really the, the sort of like holistic systems thinking that we might need to be doing right now. But um, climate change is only one of the major challenges that we are facing. Um, and it is one of the nine planetary boundaries um, which define the safe operating space for humans and other life on Earth. Um, and so you can see this from the um, Stockholm Resilience Center is uh, the most uh, current picture of where the so safe operating space exists and our overshoot. Um, so you can see that climate change, we have absolutely overshot, but not as much as, um, for example, the novel entities. So novel entities is to do with plastic pollution and the amount of plastic that we have in the way uh, in the ocean and on land, um, endocrine disrupting chemicals, all these pollutants that absolutely should not be there. Um, but, uh, and I mean also bio um, geochemical flows, that's phosphorus, nitrous, also hugely overshooting on that. Um, the picture is really, really bleak when we look at this. And the only one that we haven't um, fully quantified yet is uh, air pollution. That's, you can see it there, atmospheric aerosol loading, not yet um, quantified. But given the pretty stark picture everywhere else, and especially when it comes to pollution, it's highly likely um, that uh, air pollution is also far exceeding where we should be. Um, so this climate change almost represents the fever um, that the planet uh, as one of the symptoms of our sick planet. Um, but there is also, like I was saying, huge amounts of pollution. And the importance of trying to think in this planetary boundaries and planetary health framework is that each of these living systems within the planet can buffer for a little while. They can absorb some of the excesses that we're doing, um, but past a point, they absolutely collapse if stressed too far. And a collapse in one system can cause a collapse in another system. Um, 
triggering feedback loops um, via these tipping points within these systems. Um, and so that is why we really advocate for a planetary health perspective in a lot of the work that we do, because planetary health is really to do about these relationships between the different boundaries, the relationships between human health, natural systems, political, ecological, economic, and social systems, um, and stressing that the, the health of humans really rests on the health of the planet, and that um, if we can bring ourselves back within the safe operating space, um, that'll, that is only good for all of us. Um, so what next? Because I've painted a pretty bleak picture of where we are. Um, we absolutely need to act with speed, scale and scope. And what do I mean by that is that we need to be limiting greenhouse gas emissions and limiting warming right now. Um, I'm sure everyone is in agreement with that. Um, we need to be working in terms of action across all scales. So there is a lot to be doing at the local level, but huge amounts that needs to be transformationally changed at the global scale. Um, and then in terms of scope, so um, my area that I work in a lot is health and climate, but this needs to be touching all the different sectors. So shelter massively, um, agriculture hugely, the whole way that the economy functions. Um, we need seismic, seismic um, systemic and transformational change to fall back within those safe planetary um, limits. Uh, and then when it comes to um, sort of shelter as well as health to some extent, I think that there is a lot to be learned um, within nature-based solutions, a lot, um, from biomimicry, so sort of the innovations um, that nature has anyway, um, and trying to learn from that, especially as we have to adapt and transform to keep track with what is happening with um, our changing planetary systems. And ideally that everything should be regenerative by design. Um, uh, and that one of the other very important things is to close uh, the adaptation gap so that the, currently there is much more focus on mitigation and this is very, very important, but we also need to um, keep track of adapting to the heating that has already been locked in. Um, and there is a huge shortfall in financing to cover this. Um, and so that really needs to, to change and, and be closed. I've painted a pretty stark um, and gloomy picture, um, but it's because that is the reality of what we face. Um, and I will leave it there, but happy to answer more questions afterwards. Yeah. Hey there. Come stay with me. <laughs> so does anyone, thank you so much. Um, um, it's just brilliant to have you with us and to start the day uh, with some actual science. Um, does anyone have any questions for Tilly? Yes, Dave. Hi. Uh, oh, um, someone should bring you a microphone, sorry. Let me bring you <laughs> From Shelterbox, um, sort of a comment and a question. I did my master's in climate change about 15 years ago. And your presentation and your message is virtually identical to what we were being taught then. The question is, why haven't we done anything? Why has nobody actually done these things yet? Shall I try and use one of these? Um, thank you, yeah. Um, this, it's so horrible that that is the truth and the reality um, that this message hasn't changed that much and that scientists have been talking about this for so very long and i think it's fundamentally because those in power are not taking this seriously at all and there are the the way that the economy and everything is set up is um to make effectively profit which is driven off the resources of this finite earth and those in power don't want to change that. Um, there's recently in The Guardian, I'm sure many of you will have seen it, but um, an expose on the um, carbon bonds uh, that are happening right now, these huge investments uh, in oil field uh, exploitation, et cetera, et cetera, which will absolutely rip through our carbon budget that is remaining. Why are they doing this when we've just had COP in Glasgow recently where everyone was again reiterating that 1.5 is still alive? Um, so yeah, I, I, it's horrible that we are in this situation. <laughs> Elizabeth. <laughs> Hi. 
Um, something that I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about is, is about population growth, because mm. that to me seems like a big factor that we don't always touch on enough. And I went to an exhibition at the uh, Natural History Museum called Broken Planet or something like that, equally as uplifting as your uh, presentation. <laughs> um, and the statistic that stuck with me was something like 96% of the mammals in the whole planet are either humans or uh, bred by humans mm. for meat consumption or, or you know other animal products and and so we've absolutely you know we're a plague on the earth as it were and we're also because there's so many of us that's why there's so many natural disasters because we're in those places where things are happening would do you um kind of come across that in your work and talk about it and uh, it would be interesting to hear your perspective because it's uh, yeah Oh, it is on. Is it working? Yes. Um, yes, uh, we do. And it is all important also, um, so population growth with shelter and, and urban design and planning like that, um, I for sure agree that that is important to consider. But the, I might err still more on the fundamental problem is not to do with population growth, but to do with the consumption of certain populations in the world. So that, um, that little boxes that I showed before, the consumption of the richer countries is still what is driving this crisis right now. It isn't the growth necessarily of populations in, a, in other countries because one American equates to one American's carbon emissions per year equates to that of 50 Ethiopians per year or something. Um, so I would always move away from framing any uh, problem in a sort of uh, to do with population growth or anything like that. I still think that the issue is fundamentally consumption and excess consumption in certain countries. But when it comes to shelter and health planning and things like that, you absolutely need to know the projections in your population's growth to then be able to, to plan and strategize um, to ensure that that service is not going to become overwhelmed and that services are having full coverage across to people. Um, and so that is something that we definitely do uh, consider quite a lot. Um, and also, where are we seeing the growth in population? So is that in urban settings? And what does then that mean for the health system you have in the urban setting? Where else do you need to reach with? You need to ensure that you have better coverage. Is it okay to have one facility um, in an informal settlement, but that informal settlement can have half a million in terms of the population? Um, that's definitely, yeah, those kind of equity questions are very, very important. And then also in terms of the growth in population and where then people are living and the risk. So in um, Pakistan, the example of more than 50% or 50% of city dwellers are in those informal settlements. Why are they in informal settlements? What policies are putting people at risk? Um, and also something in our work that we try and shy away from um, when we talk about disasters is terming them as natural disasters. Um, because in truth, there is nothing natural necessarily about a disaster. There is a natural hazard that does occur, but there has always been policies that have put certain groups at risk in certain areas. Um, and so that's why we talk about natural hazards, but then a disaster, which likely has a, a huge um, injustice element to it and um, inequity that has put certain people can, for more than 20 years, for generations on generations in a flood prone place or um, on the outskirts of the city where they're likely to get hit by um, the strong winds or their shelter even isn't good enough. And that's why even slightly stronger winds are likely to destroy their shelter versus then other people in very strong concrete housing. Yeah, um, it is definitely a consideration. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Paul uh, from the ADAPT uh, initiative, uh, which is an initiative related to climate change and humanitarian action. Um, it's great to be here today. Thank you very much. Um, before I start, I think it's only fair that I make clear uh, my bona fides, as it were. Um, unlike Tilly, I'm not an expert in climate change. Uh, unlike you, I'm not an expert in shelter. So really, if we take the title of what I'm speaking about, I'm vaguely qualified only to talk to about a third of what's in the title there. Um, as a humanitarian generalist. Um, but before you ask for your money back, uh, I rather think in a way that that is as it should be. Because the, the first point I'd like to make really today is that climate change for humanitarians, I don't think it is just another cross-cutting issue. You know, it's, it's not one of these things that, 
the IASC needs to set up a working group and a task force to the working group for, and then produce some kind of policy statement and, and roll it out and, and do trainings on and, and so on. Um, it's not just a specialization. I would like to suggest that climate change changes everything. Um, the earth is now one degree, sorry, one degree warmer, formatting has changed slightly, uh, on land than the historical average, which isn't much. Um, but it does mean that we are in an environment that no human society has ever encountered, at least not in history and for most of prehistory. Um, humanity has not been in this global environment uh, since before Homo sapiens left Africa. And so that means that all of our economy, all of our technology, all of our agriculture, all of everything has developed in a historical period, which we have now left. Um, and that'll have consequences in every area of society. Uh, but for humanitarians and all humanitarians in all sectors, I think the consequences will be particularly stark. And the reason for this is threefold. I think there are three ways in which climate change is going to really change our, the way that we work or should change the way that we work and the challenges we face. The first of these three is scale. Um, as, as Tilly suggested, and the IPCC has laid out very clearly in the report in February, um, there is really no doubt now that uh, the changing climate is causing and will continue to cause more disasters, bigger disasters, uh, and more widespread disasters, or at least hazards, um, hazard events which lead to disasters. It's also the case, so it, as well as those, those hazard events, um, it's also the case that there is quite a complex relationship between um, human migration and climate change. It's, it's, it's quite difficult to say climate change is directly leading to migration in many cases, but you can say that the nature of that relationship is such, the evidence suggests the nature of that relationship is such that as a result of climate change working with other factors, we can see, a, we expect to see a massive increase in human migration, mostly within borders, uh, probably, and into urban environments, very possibly, but also potentially across borders as well. Uh, similarly, the relationship between conflict and climate is as yet quite unclear. It doesn't look yet as if um, climate is actually driving conflict or you, you, the unique driver of many conflicts. And, and that's something maybe we can discuss later. But what is happening is that the, the places, for a variety of reasons, the places which are fragile and conflict affected states are also almost uniquely the most vulnerable, uh, the most at risk to climate change uh, because of their geographical location very largely. They are also most vulnerable to the effects of climate change because of the challenges around governance, building resilience and so on to respond to climate change. So what this means is you get a wicked mix between uh, conflict and climate that makes everything much, much worse. So. And all of these things are in addition to the existing humanitarian caseload. You know, they're not instead of, they are as well as all of these things get worse. So there is no doubt that we are seeing already an increase in the scale of humanitarian activity and need as a result of climate change, and that that is going to get exponentially worse. But it's not just an issue of scale. Um, it's also the nature of crises. It's not just they're bigger, they are also going to be different. They are going to be less predictable. Now, the rules that we, if you like, standard operating procedures, the rules around things like tropical storms and cyclones, wildfires and so on, are already changing. Tropical storms that took 72 hours to develop now take less than 24 hours to develop in some cases, for example. They go in different directions. Recently, there were two cyclones, one after another, a double shot. Yeah, that hasn't happened before. So we're seeing, as the climate changes, the nature of the hazards, the hazard events changes quite significantly. 
And that really bounces back onto the way that we work because we're used to doing things in a certain way. The other thing that's different is that we're going to see, they're not new crises, of course, but they're quite new for the humanitarian system. So the, the heat events and the incredible mortality, that uh, often unreported mortality, that one is seeing from these heat events, not just in urban heat islands, but also in rural environments as well. Um, wildfires, we haven't really had to engage with those. We might have to. Uh, as Tilly said, glacial thawing and the sort of sudden massive flash floods and then dam collapses that are potential, you know, potentially going to come out of those things. So all of this is, is not just bigger, it's different. And then the third element, which I think we need to be aware of, is that climate also changes the context or potentially, now we're less sure about this, but climate may well significantly change the context in which we work. We can be fairly certain that the people that we work for are going to be overall much, much more vulnerable when big hazards hit. Um, and the reason for that is climate change is causing sequentially lots of smaller, you know, floods that don't necessarily make the newspapers, droughts that don't make the newspapers, but they're happening in some places now every year or two years out of three. And so, as some of our colleagues in India have said, you know, climate change is already a permanent crisis for many people. And that means when the big things hit, the, the, the community resilience is much, much less. People are much more vulnerable because they don't have the reserves. The second thing is what Francois Grunewald of URD has called the degraded environment. Um, many of the larger climate impacts we can expect will possibly impact on the things that we traditionally have needed a lot of like ports and roads and warehousing and it so are, we will need to be able to work in these environments where a lot of the sort of basis basic stuff isn't necessarily there because the scale of these climate events has wiped them out the third thing that is going to change the environment we're in. And I think it's something we're not really aware of is that while humanitarians aren't particularly, haven't particularly engaged with climate issues, military has, you know, the US military in particular, um, other NATO military forces, not sure about uh, beyond NATO, but other NATO military forces are putting huge amounts of taxpayer money into looking at the military consequences and the security consequences of climate change. They have big areas, you know, that are looking at this. Um, and we can expect that humanitarian context to become increasingly securitized as a result of some of these initiatives within the military. And then the fourth thing that we need to be aware of is our funding is already plateaued. Yeah. Now, what's going to happen to that funding if we want funding to respond to floods in Bangladesh? when Germany is underwater. You know, it's, I, I, I would argue, and we haven't seen this yet, it's gonna be increasingly difficult to raise funding from tax paying publics or private donors uh, when the same events are occurring domestically. So what does this mean? The change is then basically to, to sum up, bigger, different, more difficult environments to work in. It means, I think, that we've got to really seriously think, not just about greening our operations, but changing the basic way that we work. We've got to think a lot more, and I'm not the first person I recognize to say this, we've got to think a lot more about local leadership for all the reasons that we know, but also for other very pragmatic reasons. Yeah? One, internationals will be, in many cases, unable to get there. Two, these will be permanent ongoing crises where there's really the model of sending people in or sending goods in from outside is not really applicable in a context that goes on and on and on. Two, we're gonna to have to get much when we don't play nice. We're not very good at working with people that we don't know. We haven't got the skills in many cases of, of building rapid partnerships with the people that we need partnerships with meteorological offices, local government, NDMAs, insurance companies, other risk management, uh, social welfare and protection. All of these 
are going to be an important part of the operating environment, far more important than we are. Yeah? And how good are we going to get and how quickly at being the minor partner in other work rather than having it all run around the HCT and the cluster system? Um, we need to change when we work. And obviously, you know, for shelter people, I think this is this is uh, an obvious and, and, and done thing already. But acting along a continuum that starts with mitigating climate change, so greening and environmental impact, the greening of our work, but then moves through resilience, moves into preparedness, anticipatory earlier action, response. Uh, and reconstruction. Now, again, nothing new in saying this, but climate change means that a response-led way of working is really not going to work for all the reasons that I've outlined before. If we want to rise to this challenge, we've got to be serious about, we don't, not all organizations have got to do all of this, but where do we fit in? Where do we, often playing a, 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 a subsidiary role, where do we fit along that spectrum? And we're going to need new tools and approaches um, to deal with this world that we haven't dealt with. One of which is going to be the approach of being flexible, being adaptable, not a humanitarian strength, um, sort of in terms of evaluation. of We're getting better at it with COVID, but it's not something that we have traditionally been very good at. What does that mean for shelter? Well, well you know, you know, better than I do. I'm just going to throw some ideas out. Um, I think it means, and you know, there is a lot of movement in the sector, and there's a lot of movement from donors as already around this, about, you know, doing no harm, not contributing to, to degradation, the greening uh, element of things at one end of the spectrum, if you like. And, you know, that's about, it's about transport, uh, logistics chains, it's about materials, the materials you use. In settlement, it's also or perhaps more impactful, it's about, you know, settlements and aquifers. Where is the water coming from in particular, you know? Um, if people are being moved or are spontaneously moving and we're responding to that, are they going to a place where there's going to be massive environmental impact, long-term environmental impact on resources that we can't get back? Now, this is something that the shelter sector has been very good at, and there is a lot of focus. Moving along that spectrum, um, we move into the operational work, which is, you know, as Tilly said, future-proofing shelters and settlements. And we're not talking about, you know, it's still fairly short term, but when we're putting in a shelter on the basis of designs that have worked in the past, is that design going to be good for a year? Yeah, when that year might have massive 50 degree temperatures in it. Yeah, when that year might have much more flooding. So both shelter and settlement, is it just based on what worked in the past, or are we actually thinking about the threats that are the people we work for are going to be facing? Um, preparedness. What does preparedness look like for shelter? You know, obviously it's about there's, that there are elements of stockpiling, um, but there are you know also probably other elements that we need to think about. Um, you know, the the the, the advanced distri distribution of portable. Settlers, shelters, for example, so that people can take stuff with them or elements of what they have with them um, in areas that are likely to flood. Uh, preparedness that doesn't really build on the model that we have of kind of moving in with stuff, but moves on a model where things have to happen much closer to the site of the hazard event. Um, and so on. I think you could probably look at more or less everything that you do and think about, is that gonna work in the world that we know, you know, we know is the world we're in and increasingly is going to be the world that we'll be in in five years, not to, not to mention 10. Overall, this looks like, to me as a non-specialist, it looks like new materials, it looks like new business processes, it looks like new logistics uh, operations, it looks like new designs of shelter, new designs of settlements, it looks like new partnerships, it looks like new skills, and it looks like all of that happening very quickly. It also looks like 
relationships with risk, uh, with social protection, with other actors being built up. Um, again, on a country by country basis, as Tilly was saying, because Pakistan is very different from Bangladesh and different parts of Pakistan are very different from each other in terms of the threat horizon. So taken together for the humanitarian sector, and I think probably for shelter, this is a massive transformation. No, this is a, a, a huge, when we already have, you know, nobody's got time for any of this you know, with Ukraine, and, but it's a massive transformation. Um, currently, from the work that we were doing over the last year, um, awareness around this is very, very uneven from agency to agency and within agencies, particularly worrying when we talk to HCs or emergency directors of organizations, they don't, it's not really their thing. Yeah, they've got someone who does that. You know, they've got someone who does the climate bit. So it's not really part of the overall structuring of people's thought. And I think it's got to be part of the, not everything that we think about, but I think it's got to be part of the structuring of all of our thought, particularly those people who are in charge. Um, there is also a lack of clarity around programmatic responses because we really don't, nobody knows what works. And there are very high levels of uncertainty in all of this, but we won't know what works unless we try it out and then tell people. Um, poor coordination, strong silos. Yeah, that, you know, it's no surprise to, to, to any of you that that is the case in, in the humanitarian world. Yeah, sadly, this goes well beyond the humanitarian world. We see it also in the um, response within governments where the Ministry of Environment is not talking to the NDMA, the National Disaster Management Agency, who are not talking to the Meteorological Office because they're all fighting over the, the climate change funding, for example. We see it in the relationship between the climate change actors and the development actors. We see it in the relationship between civil society and government in climate change affected places. So this is a place where the humanitarian system uh, is every bit as bad as everybody else, you know, in terms of the siloing and the inability to play nice. But um, that's got to change. And the other thing, and I sort of leave it here, I think, in a, in a typically upbeat way that Tilly started, and, you know, I'll kind of continue, is that we're really bad at change. You know, these are huge changes. And yet, if you look at accountability or localization, um, I know I don't look like it, but you know, I was an undergraduate in the 90s. And uh, the things that I heard at Humanitarian Networks and Partnership Week, you know, the big thing in Geneva this week, were exactly the same things as I was being taught in 1992. Yeah. So how long is that with really no change in these areas? Yeah but we've got a big change to make. I would leave not in, on an entirely bum note, yeah, but by saying this, change has happened in the sector. For example, cash, for example, coordination. We are, things are different. They happen over quite long time scales. We tend not to notice them, but they do happen. But they don't happen because people in Geneva or Washington um, come up with a policy and then roll that policy out. Yeah, there is. There are decades of failure of that approach to change. The changes that have been successful were the changes that you made on the ground. Yeah? They were people dealing with a problem, a shelter problem, for example, that needed to be dealt with and which no one had worked out and they just did stuff. Yeah. Often the people who did stuff weren't humanitarians, they were communities or they were local governments, but stuff was done to overcome problems. And as that stuff got done, it got bigger and people started to take notice. And eventually the donors got on, got on board with it. And then the IAC came on board with it. And then you started to see change. Yeah. So the outlook is by no means rosy, but the process to get there is clear. Yeah. The process to get there is look for the things that you're doing, and they don't necessarily have to be badged with climate. Yeah. The things you're doing that are already moving us towards that place where we have a more flexible, more adaptable, more subsidiary, more locally based shelter response. And then do more of those things. Thank you. Thanks, Paul.
really happy to hear you broaden out the concept of to all humanitarians and to think about this kind of subsidiary role. Um, there's a question in there somewhere about the ext extinction of the sector as we know it in where that might head. But my question is actually about um, the very last thing on your slide about um, other actors like insurance and social protection, because some of the really interesting innovation in social protection mm. rollouts on coming um, in countries without necessarily the model of our understanding of welfare as a kind of insurance pool where people pay in. There's what they're calling kind of non-contributory social protections, mm -hmm. which are like these kind of cash transfers that go directly to um, often actually women, but also just um, identified in individuals and households. I'm really interested in how that might work for lumpy things like homes. Uh, by the way, I think this is a totally intractable issue also in our approach to housing, but in, in the, the UK approach to housing, yeah. but how, is there a way that you can foresee of getting money directly to people that deals with some of the material objects of infrastructure and housing? So a notch up from say a daily amount for food um, into um, a slightly different type of utility or service or thing that, that is sh safe shelter, safer shelter yeah. or infrastructure, if that question makes sense. It makes absolute sense. I don't have an answer for it because I, <laughs> because you know more about it than I do, I'm afraid. Um, but I think it's a very good question to discuss today, potentially. What, what, I, what I would say is um, recently been looking at the, certainly the UK's response to COVID-19. Um, where, of course, cash and humanitarian cash, humanitarian response to COVID-19 overseas, uh, where cash and humanitarian cash was a, you know, a, a very important part of that response, not just from the UK, but from, from the community in general. Um, and, you know, a very useful part of that response. But I think there's a couple of things that stand out there. One is that humanitarian cash overall is not well articulated with social protection, with state-led social protection. And in general, cash agencies who were doing cash transfers partly because for all the reasons you know it was happening very quickly but it didn't really seem to be up to speed with how the welfare system was working and how they could articulate with it so even before getting to the lumpiness i think the articulation bit to be even having that relationship to make that work is a first step that we need to look at um, and then and then it becomes a little bit easier because the social protection is a really well studied area and people know lots of stuff about how to make it work. And actually, many states put the stuff that was known into action very, very quickly. In COVID. Um, and so so that's an area where we don't have to make it up at all. All we've got to do is link up with the people who know how it works and then put questions like that to them. huge IFI, World Bank, ADB type money that's coming in through government is going to the places that is exceptionally vulnerable. And, uh, and yet at local government level, at sort of provincial or, you know, you're finding really qualified, very impassioned people who mm -hmm. are seeing uh, the prospects of terrible things happening. I want to give an example. It was in Mozambique after Cyclone I die, and then a month later there was Cyclone Kenneth. Uh, in the north. It was the most powerful cyclone to hit Eastern Africa in, on record, whatever. So 45,000 houses destroyed. Just like, So it's not really the number of houses destroyed. It was the local government people that said, hey, yeah, there's a bunch of displaced here, but I've got 50,000 families in different parts of this province that are in high risk areas, right? But they knew it. It was, you know, badly designed, urban planning, all the rest of it. And he said, if we could just have some to get them relocated in a proper way with the right kind of infrastructure, more of the drain in a place that's higher, away from the flooding, all this, he was absolutely right. And the shelters, yeah, they would come later after you did the right site planning. Right? You can't just plop a shelter, talk about sheltering when, sorry, uh, <laughs> good, you're, you're right. So my question is, uh, the point is no funding for that. 
I was shelter cluster there, and just yeah, there was no point talking. The, yeah. So how do we change the donor mindset and the IFI mindset when these are the problems that have been identified by by the whole government, but nobody's really listening? Oh. Yeah. Uh, it's that it's a very good point. Um, and Lee could that could just be that could just be a day right there, couldn't it? Uh, I think the the one thing that that has come up quite a lot in terms of you know if we're talking about the changing nature, particularly of international NGOs, you don't necessarily have the mandate that the UN has or the Red Cross movement structure. Um, one of the areas of potential comparative advantage is in putting people in touch with government and particularly local governments and this is something that you know people have been talking about just helping develop the civil space but of course an emergency is very bad time to do that yeah so these are longer term issues and and part of part of the part of the challenge for humanitarians is you know it's not really our skill sets but it is also the case that if you look at climate funding or development funding, which is what's needed to do this, that's not going to the places where it's needed the most, because, you know, it's a vicious cycle. In order to get climate or development funding, you need to have shovel ready projects. You know, if you have poor governance or just limited governance, it's very hard to create, you know, big projects on, at, at scale. And so all of the climate funding and much of the development funding is going to places where it's less needed. The difficult bit is always those humanitarian contexts where something needs to be done. The donors are not keen to put funding in for anything of any kind of long-term or institutional building nature. Um, and with less funding, probably less so. And we're kind of one of the few actors in that environment. Um, the only thing, and it's, it's a very real, you know, it's a kind of catch-22 type type situation, or one a really good one to underline. The only thing I think that one can say is that it does happen in some cases, and maybe we're just not loud enough about that, you know. Um, there was a lot of nexus -y kind of stuff that was actually, you know, everyone know the nexus, you know, what does that mean? It's just resilience and another. Um, but actually some of it was really, really good. You know, some of it was really climate appropriate, really. But we're not very good at saying, you know, this is good, this, is, this really works. Unless we're kind of doing it on a, my agency did this thing, now give me some money. Yeah. But as a, a, a sector saying, here is an approach and this approach is working, and it could well be this, you know, it's a locally, it's local civil society and local government say, this is what needs to be done. And we did it with some money that we scraped together and it worked really well, even though it wasn't my agency that did it. I, I think that's the only way that we can go forward. And sorry, I spoke much too much, much on that. You <laughs> tapped a vein there. 